Hey everybody, Jazzy here. Here is my recap for year 16 of Thrill of the Grill, my solo Warley world over on Twitch. My first mission of the year is to evict the Volt Goats from the Oasis Desert once and for all. I have plans for this wildfire safe real estate that does not call for bovids on steroids and I have taken great pains to provide some cushy accommodations for them in the adjacent desert. We currently have four herds, but one herd I'm gonna keep for my auto horn farm. I have four pens, so one of them will just be empty until I can spawn in a new herd. The traditional technique for moving volt goat herds involves killing off all but one goat and then slowly nudging them in the direction that you want. Herds will only move at a certain pace, so there's a lot of nudging and waiting, nudging and waiting. If you push them too quickly, then they won't update the herd location, and sometimes it's hard to tell if you're moving them too fast. But when I visited Juki's world, he showed me a much simpler way. It seems that just moving all the goats in a herd at the same time will cause a more gradual updating of herd location, perhaps because they're able to re-establish the herd more frequently based on the relative distance between each goat. I don't really understand the mechanics, but it's way simpler just playing sheepdog for a little while and not having to worry as much about moving one goat too far away from the herd. This also seems a lot safer than just moving one goat because if a goat dies, you don't lose the herd. Now, once I got a herd right outside the pen, I did kill all but one so I could nudge the last one inside. Turns out I didn't need to because the pen is large enough for the goat to pathfind right in. Beats the hell out of waiting for night to nudge them inside. Now, two of the remaining herds ended up very close together and I was worried that they had actually merged. I've heard this happen sometimes and it's a good reason to give each herd its own pen. Fortunately, they were just really close together, and I managed to tease the two apart. I'm thankful that once you put a little distance between the two herds, all of the herd members will split up accordingly. With all three herds safely in their new prison, I mean home, I really want to get to work on the next big project. First thing I want to do is grab some berry bushes from my loot world. Now, the main resources I'm planning to collect from this world are berry bushes, honeycomb, and turf. I'm really hoping that I got a rocky biome because I did not get one in my main overworld. But for now, I'm focusing on berry bushes. And check it out, we got a Berger spawned in the loot world. I'm not really interested in fighting him, but it's getting me thinking. I could very likely use him to harvest some of the beehives near the Moonstone Forest. But that's a project for another day. I got what I came for, and this Berger is reminding me that we need to get home and harvest our deciduous trees. Sometimes they all pop at once. Look at this, we get five poison birch nuts spawning in a complete circle around Berger. This is a problem because I can't lead him away if he keeps getting whipped by the trees. Eventually I managed to draw him out, but he took a lot of damage. I need to heal him a lot when all this is done. But unfortunately I have to bail because I'm gonna be late for my first boss fight of the year, the shadow pieces. This time I'm gonna try something a little bit different. I'm throwing in an extra rook piece. So if we kill the knight and then the bishop, we'll be left with two level three shadow rooks. We can kill both of these guys to harvest two shadow atriums in a single new moon. Now, unless I was gonna cheese this fight, I would not attempt this with any other tier three boss. And I'm not sure that I would try this with more than two rooks. They're the only tier three chess piece that you can reliably kite but there's still a lot of potential damage in just two of these. It's also really hard to sync up their attacks, so you're just constantly dodging, getting in like two to three hits and then dodging again. It took so much longer just from all the constant kiting, but it was good practice keeping on the road and watching their attack animations. So after that massacre, we went back to finish the job. Berger is looking pretty roughed up after that encounter, so I decided just this once I was really going to treat the guy. 18 dragon pies and 14 mokekas. That's over 1400 HP restored. Not even cheesecake eats this well. This is not much cheaper than the healing salves I gave him last year. I think it's glomergoop for you from now on, buddy. Day 1068, I'm finally building a road from my chest zone over to the hound trap. I've been cutting it close recently with hound waves, and cobblestone's going to become more important for getting out of my base in time, especially now that my base is getting a lot larger. This also gives me a path to the houndiest that doesn't take me right past the pig farm. And now for boss number two of the year, Dragonfly. Some viewers wanted to see the no wall method, so I gave it a shot. 
Honestly, I've been spoiled on double bone armor lately, so <laughs> it was good for me to revisit my kiting skills. So without walls, you need to take care of the larva that she spawns from the lava ponds. The easiest way to dispatch them is to freeze them. Each one can be frozen in three hits from an ice staff, but if they're close to any heat sources, then they'll take more hits to freeze. This can get tricky around the lava pools and when other larvae start exploding into fire. Once Dfly summons the last larva, you can put her to sleep and take out the rest of the larva. As long as she's sleeping when the final larva dies, she won't enrage, so it doesn't cost too many more pan flute uses than normal. I personally don't prefer using up blue gems like this in the late game, but I'm happy to showcase the strategy every once in a while. I'm spending the beginning part of winter removing all of the turf from this peninsula towards the back of the oasis desert. I'm going to turn this into one sprawling build that's going to be one of the larger builds I've designed and definitely the largest I've attempted thus far in this world. But because I sacrificed all my healing foods to Berger, it is now time to cook 40 brand spanking new bokekas. Barnacle, onion, tomato, and for filler, I'm gonna use honey. It didn't occur to me while cooking, but winter is actually an excellent time to cook because the ambient temperature will reduce the spoilage time of food until I bundle it up. It seems like a negligible perk until you realize that a perfectly fresh mukeka is gonna go stale in about four days. So if it's out of a bundle for half a day while we're cooking a stack, then a 25% reduction in spoilage is definitely helpful. Day 1075, I'm doing some hunting at the triple Mac biome, mainly to get more tusks for walking canes. I've never done a lot of walrus killing in this world, and I want to increase my overall supply of lazy explorers. I think I left a lot of them in the atrium, and because of that, my overworld supply has always been a little bit light. I had spent a few nights with the forest stalker, just collecting lesser glowberries and foliage. Winter's a good time to do this because the nights are super long, but now that I have a ton of glowberries, I want to cook up some moose. I'm going to harvest an equal amount of juicy berries and cook them two to two in a crock pot. This might be the cheapest recipe for moose. And both of the ingredients are really easy to harvest from the comfort of my base. Once I gather a bundle's worth of lesser glowberries, I can just harvest 14 juicy berry bushes and cook up 20 moose without going anywhere. Quality of life. The one and only class of the year is going to give me crap plus scales, plus wax paper. I like wax paper. Ironically, this is probably my primary source of charcoal for the year, which I only really need for scaled furnaces at this point. I haven't made too many other crock pots and I haven't felt the need to make drying racks. I might actually have more red gems than charcoal at this point. Day 1082, I'm in the caves digging up some rocky turf. Now, I've noticed on some streams and YouTube comments of Megabase videos where a viewer will see all the cobblestone in a world and make these accusations of cheating, basically saying that there couldn't possibly exist that much rocky turf in the world. But the caves are massive and there's so much rocky turf down here, you'd be pretty hard pressed to run out of it, even if you don't get much on the surface, which I haven't. That's not to say it could never happen, it's just never happened with me. In spring, I was about to pop Bee Queen when we get a frog rain. I don't think they will target Bee Queen or Grumblebees, so I brought them over to the Beefalo. The herds are enormous, and I'm not really worried about killing them off. They're really a great option for dealing with frogs. I probably should keep a beefalo hat over here in the future though, just in case I want to shave them while they're in heat. So after that, we get in our spring Bee Queen fight. I blew the pan flute about 12 times. If you're interested in my strategy, then I would highly recommend watching this fight in the full video because it was definitely one of my cleaner kills. I'll put a link with the timestamp in the description. Second frog rain of the season hits shortly afterward. And for that one, we go to the moose. I'm not sure what I want to do with these frog legs. My first inclination is for fish cordon blue, but it sucks that barnacles aren't worth enough fish to be used for those. So I may end up doing a bit of fishing and see if we can get enough to use all these frog legs. But realistically, they're probably gonna live in a bundle for a while. I'm harvesting the gecko grass and I'm noticing more and more that they run out of the pen and start hugging the outer door, almost like they think they can get out. Maybe it's just the furthest point from Chester, but this is kind of becoming a problem because if more than one gecko is here when I'm trying to get out, I can't get out without pushing one of them through the door. So I'm gonna be experimenting with this pen a bit more, just 
trying to figure out a cheaper solution than just telepoofing in and out. And now I'm placing the first turf down on the new build. I want to make a sprawling bee park. So I'm envisioning bee boxes, flowers, statues, wood walls, birch nut trees, and some other assorted decorations. Aside from the roads, I'll be using exclusively slimy turf, and single turf design is not very common for me. But I think that for this zone, it'll look more cohesive and less unnecessarily diverse. I'm trying to get better at that. Just because I have all these textures and colors in my palette doesn't mean I need to use all of them or even more than one or two of them. I'm generally more interested in finding turfs and structures that complement more than they contrast. But this project will be ongoing for over a year. But now it is late spring and I'm off to the ruins for the season. Right here, I was giving a new player advice about crafting a football helm, basically saying that it helps mitigate some of the incidental damage that you're gonna take. And just as I say that, a depth worm takes a big 75 HP bite out of my health. It was either the worst timing or the perfect timing. I'm getting down early this year because I want to take advantage of some spring rains for killing the mobs down here with Volt Goat Jelly. And I managed to reach Ancient Guardian while he was wet. Normally this fight takes me just about a full day with the fresh handbat, but this time we managed to pull it off in a little over two minutes. That ain't bad for a no cheese fight, but apparently RNG favors default damage modifiers because the haul from the large ornate chest was one of the worst I've ever seen. But for the rest of spring, I'm just trying to kill as many wet clockworks as possible before everything dries up. We managed to clear an entire branch before the start of summer, so that's pretty cool. Right here, I'm slamming some honey cake to clear the statue zones. But yeah, the ruins get cleared halfway through summer. I'm definitely doing this again in spring. It was way worth it. If I come down earlier, I'll just stock up on fish cordon blue for the heavy rain. I, I might not even need an eyebrella, but we'll experiment some more. I'm bringing back a bundle of star staves, a bundle of lazy foragers, and two bundles of thulacite walls. Only thing I use thulacite for at this point is amulets and the occasional helm, so yeah, I'm happy to spam the walls. On the way out, I tried to run in and patch a wall in the monkey pods, but they beat me to it. So we're leaving in style with a horde at our heels. It actually helped that Hutch aggroed a few of them by the time we made it back to the light bulbs, so I was eventually able to pick them off. But it's really not something I want to do every time. Back on the surface, I'm running straight to Antline to give her a trinket before she rages at me. I gave her a potato cup, but I didn't realize that only bought me a day. And sure enough, we get sinkholes a couple days later. The first sinkholes of the run. I'm so embarrassed. Maybe coming back upstairs was a bad idea. I planted a batch of 24 onion seeds spread across four plots, and I fertilized each plot with three hits of super growth formula. It's really easy to produce this formula, and I'm happy to spend it on happy onion plants. But check this out, we get a weed right before they finish, and that causes a bunch of onions to not be giant. I'm not sure how I could have prevented this, I was so attentive. It's really not fair. Speaking of unfair, last day of summer I was set to harvest more foliage from the forest stalker and the dog started barking like clockwork the moment the sun sets. I was salty all the way to the hound trap. And here I am thinking I could come back upstairs and be productive in summer. Oh well. At least we got an onion harvest in. Next year is going to be dedicated in large part to the building of the new bee park. I cannot wait to share this one with you. Looking back at the completed project, I could say that it's probably one of my best builds. We're also going to explore a bit and discover a couple other very nice resources of the loot world that are going to help our base building efforts immensely. I hope you enjoyed the recap, and maybe next time you can catch us live over on Twitch. Take care.